two extra times in a matter of a week, plus another game where you win one nothing and lose control, following a draw to come back from the World Cup break. I'm feeling the same thing everybody else is. Every time it feels like Barca take two steps forward, they take one step back. And with this extra time, penalty, victory, whatever you want to call it in the Spanish Super Cup that has them facing Real Madrid in the final in a few days, I've got a bunch of thoughts. They're mixed, some good, some bad, but let's do it. The five headlines from Barcelona's 2-2 in penalties win over Real Betis in the semifinal of the Spanish Super Cup. Headline one is what are the stakes? At its core, this unfortunately is a match and the Spanish Super Cup has been something that since its origins, kool genuinely haven't cared about. But in a season when trophies are potentially going to be at a premium, we do keep saying it. The Xavi desperately needs to win some kind of trophy. This club is desperate for any kind of trophy and the Spanish Super Cup would suffice. So I think there's a reason why you're seeing Barcelona pushing for a trophy that is usually, and I'd say on paper, pretty meaningless. And it feels like that way too, having this whole thing in Saudi Arabia. You can tell that obviously they're pushing for a Barcelona-Real Madrid final. They want the Clasico, which they're finally getting in what is their third or fourth attempt at trying to do this. For Barcelona, and this is a bit unfair for their opponents, they don't deserve to be getting the 6 million euros that they're getting when Real Betis is getting less than a million just to take part in this because Real Betis and Real Madrid should be the two contesting this, the winner of the Liga against the winner of the Copa del Rey from a season ago with Real Betis. So the fact that Barcelona are kind of having to play these extra two games and getting a little money for it, I mean, more money than they probably deserve again in relation to Betis, well, I don't know. That puts a weird taste in my mouth, plus the atmosphere, and I know that they were inflating some of those attendance numbers, but the way the stadiums are built with such a distance between the fans and the field and Who knows how many were even in that stadium that night because of the numbers being fudged. I don't know. It's just a weird situation in Saudi Arabia. And it feels like it wasn't necessary to take Ronald Araujo. Reports are before this game that he was carrying some kind of injury, that maybe he shouldn't have pushed it. And yet he goes 120 minutes in this contest. Was that necessary? I'm actually not really sure. I think, as I've said, a trophy is really, really essential. But if it's at the cost of playing Araujo 120 minutes and then having to start him again against Real Madrid on the weekend, then not having Lewandowski or Alba and Ferran Torres for the next game in the Liga. Well, that's a lot of omissions up top and at the back even for the Navarro who have to be healthy. And as I've said this week, Araujo is, and his health, essential to any success that Barcelona are going to have in the league this season. Even the nature of the uniform today felt like it was weird stakes with the red shorts and the red socks. For those who need a reason for that, well, Barcelona actually knew that this was going to be a problem early on in the year. They registered this as an official kit at the start of the season, anticipating that this might be a problem at some point because Real Betis shorts are black, and that was too close to Barcelona's home navy shorts, so they had to go with the red shorts and the red socks. So a weird fit. Looked odd the whole game, but hey. I think that was the least of Barcelona's worries. Two is another strong start without a goal. This was what was concerning about at least the first half, that Barcelona were playing Real Betis completely off the field for the first, what, 20 or so minutes again? Very much like Atletico Madrid on the weekend with the exact same result. It's another one of those instances where I'm going to credit Xavi for getting it all right and for Real Betis. And I think this time around, I was more complimenting on Xavi on the weekend against Simeone. And Pellegrini, who is one of the top managers in the Liga, has been a top manager in world football for going on 20 years, he kind of did get it wrong here with his man-marking system against Barcelona's midfield trio of De Jong and Pedri and Gabi. So what the idea for Betis was to have Fakir trying to man-mark De Jong, which meant either Araujo or Koundé had space to run into if they were the open CB. And when I say run into, I mean dribble into that space. And that allowed Barcelona to not only take up that space, it also heightened the line of confrontation. When Araujo and Koundé playing the center back pair, which we don't really see too often yet, they're able to use their speed to make sure they cut out any counterattacks, and that's what worked to good effect in the first half. The first breakdown actually came when Barca held the ball, and Barcelona and De Jong, they pretty much worked around this. The first breakdown didn't come until about the 22nd minute or so when Barca held the ball. Fakir pushed off De Jong to Ter Stegen to put him under pressure, but De Jong hesitated on the ball to him, one of the few hesitations De Jong had on the afternoon, allowing Canales to mark both De Jong and Pedri and allow Fakir to get forward, which did force Ter Stegen to turn the ball over deep in his own half of the field. But if Barcelona were able to bypass that first little bit of pressure from Fakir, well, it was Guido Rodriguez trying to mark Pedri, and that didn't really work out for Real Betis either. And it was surprising, even though this year under Pellegrini, for those who haven't been watching, they've been much more defensively sound than they have in previous seasons. I actually kind of like Barcelona in that way. But I was still surprised to see them sitting back as deep as they were in that 4-2-3-1, especially in that first half, and just trying to absorb pressure for kind of no reason at all. I felt like they should have been getting forward a bit more. 
but also credit to Barcelona for taking advantage of the fact that they were sitting so deep. Whenever they didn't have possession, that being Barca, they were pressing high. It was man-to-man with the midfielders. And Pedri, while I hate to see him play as many minutes as he is and playing these full games, he does have the mobility to be able to track Rodriguez. It's not like he got anything away from him. And Gabi, the same way, is able to easily track Canales. And Canales is usually a bit brighter, but I'm not sure. He just didn't bring his best today. It's why he was taken off probably at halftime for Cavallo, where they switched things up. Then the wingers to the fullbacks, and Lewandowski goes to the ball side center back. So all that stuff makes sense with the way Xavi wants to press, and it worked to good effect. And even with Eitor Rubial and Miranda, two fullbacks not known for the 1v1 defending, it was really good to see for Barcelona, once again just focusing on the first half, for Barca that there wasn't an overreliance on the wings like usual. Now Lewandowski coming back in the team is one reason for that, but Barca's direct build-up through the middle, particularly with vertical balls from De Jong and Pedri, was quite promising. And I think that's why in the 19th minute, you saw that the possession 81 to 19 in favor of Barcelona, certainly on the front foot. The first time that Barcelona looked to have a little bit of a weakness was that Koundé back pass to Der Stegen, which could have ended calamity, but there was that big man, Ron Araujo, again. So Araujo, with the ball, he's been a lot cleaner since he came back, hasn't been perfect, but it seems like both he and Koundé, I mean, they're good enough defenders to basically make up for the mistake that the other one might make, and that's what Koundé had Araujo doing for him in that instance. The one thing I will say in that first 20 minutes that I have in my notes that I was a bit frustrated by was that Lewandowski in particular had this long touch. We saw Rafinha as well. There was this long touch that Roberto had one right before halftime that all these players seemingly were taking, bringing the ball down in the final third of Betis, and I felt like in those instances there was great build-up play by Barcelona. They were moving the ball well, and we talked about earlier in the season how Barcelona were not horizontally moving the ball side to side, not letting the ball do the work for them, and I thought they were really doing that well. But again, it was that long touch on what should have been some final ball to lead to a shot that was letting them down. And it was that point when I was like, oh, this could be the thing that comes back to bite them. And that does bring us to headline number three, which is your turn, my turn. And that's how this game kind of went. Barcelona should have won it. They were on the front foot. But every time that Barcelona seemed to, let's say, putting the game on ice, they gave Real Betis a lifeline and Betis took it. I talked extensively in the last podcast about Barcelona getting up in games, then giving the opportunity for the other team to come back, take control from Barcelona, and Real Betis were able to basically do that as in take control of this game on three separate occasions, getting two goals from it. The first time Barcelona lost control was unfortunate because it didn't even come on a real goal. It came on Pedri's offside goal, with Rafinha being offside by just a toe. I know people argue about that, but I mean, the VAR technology is what it is. That's the ruling. So Rafinha offside by just a little bit. And then the Pedri goal, a complete mistake by Guido Rodriguez, doesn't track him. And Pedri and Gabi, especially in the first half, were doing really well finding space into the box where Rodriguez and Canales were not tracking them. But then Barcelona lost a little fight after that offside goal. And Betis had another push after the actual first goal even was scored for Barca, which was a good goal too. On the counter, Barca absolutely pedestrian getting the ball out of their own half. It was weird to see. Koundé's header barely going five yards and Rafinha giving it to Pedri. But then Betis must have been getting a little tired heading into the half because they didn't put Pedri under any pressure. It was a long diagonal to the Melee who beats Rubial, and while Lewandowski didn't finish the first time, he got the second and put Barca ahead. And I wouldn't call that goal an over-reliance on Lewandowski's goal scoring either, because 90% of the work was done by Pedri's long ball to Demele, and then Demele getting by the fullback and making a 2v2 situation. So at that point in the game, it did feel like, eh, maybe Barcelona's going to have back-to-back 1-0 wins, and just grind it out and people will complain, but it is what it is in 90 minutes, because Real Madrid the day before had played extra time and penalties, so I mean maybe they'd be a bit more tired if that was going to be the final result. But, of course... Changes were made, and that brings us to headline four, which is subs all wrong. A lot of questions for Xavi bringing in Busquets and Ferran Torres, and not even bringing those guys in, but taking off De Jong and Dembélé in the circumstance that he did. I get the Dembélé thing because of minutes, but Frankie De Jong, yeah, real puzzling. Real Betis changed things up at halftime, adding William Cavallo to the match for Canales, and that game, Rodri and Luis Enrique, just a bit more cover, so they could push forward with a little more reckless of manner and didn't have to defend as much because Cavallo a much more natural defensive midfielder than Canales. And Betis did that in the early parts of the second half, getting forward on the counter a bit more. And then things went completely off the rails when Xavi took who was really good in this game, that being Frankie de Young, a fine performance. And it's odd because we'll talk about the stats from this performance tomorrow because they're counterintuitive. I usually rely on the stats, you know that, but they're counterintuitive actually what the real eye test was, that when Barcelona had Frankie de Young coming out of the game and the man who's meant to control it, that being Busquets, came in, then Barcelona completely lost control. And statistically, it wasn't even a Busquets thing. Busquets had more interceptions. He had more important tackles or key tackles, as they're saying, inside the box or inside Barcelona's half of the field. 
But yet, we know that Frankie de Jong and having him behind Gavi and Pedri had Barcelona controlling this match to much greater effect. So I'm not sure if it was, I don't know if it was pre-planned or whatever it was, but that wound up not being the right move for Barcelona. And then Dembele, who's been playing a lot of minutes in the last two matches, it made sense that he came out. But instead of having Ansu Fati come in earlier, it was Ferran Torres, who, as we know, is suspended. So I understand why he came in this game, because he's now not going to be playing for about a week until the Copa del Rey next midweek. But Ferran Torres also wasn't in at all. For Ferran, I, I will talk about him tomorrow as well on the pod, because I don't want to be hyperbolic in saying that, you know, I have been, and Emil has helped me on this on the podcast. You know, we've defended the idea of Ferran Torres, and I don't, man, I don't want to say that this match was indicative of how low he could go, because I almost want to throw this one out. It was that bad. This was the worst performance for Ferran Torres, in my opinion, in a Barcelona uniform. I mean, this must be rock bottom. I can't imagine if it is, because if he does this again, I don't know how Xavi plays him. I don't know how the club doesn't find some kind of suitor at a huge discount, which is insane when you look at his amortization and his contract and all those things that went into actually bringing him in last January. It was a really tough moment for Ferran Torres in this game. Really rough. The Busquets thing puzzling as well, but taking out Dembele and De Jong for Torres and Busquets, that's where it all went wrong. Pellegrini's men pushed higher and got Barca on the back foot, including a long shot by Fakir when no one in the midfield picked him up, and that was kind of a precursor to things to come. Betty finds the equalizer, and this is all about missing tackles. Alba and Torres both flying in after a fake from a shot from Henrique. Fakir coming in late from the right, and because Alba and Torres were caught, Kunde had to step to Henrique, which left Fakir wide open, and obviously because Araujo was too busy contending with the guys in the middle, he's late to come out, and it all happens because both Alba and Torres wound up missing that tackle, just flying in on that fake. Barcelona winds up ending this game with four center backs, Alonso as a left back, Kunde moving to right back with Christensen coming on, and it seemed like that wasn't going to be a talking point because Lewandowski's offside not a winner looked like it should have been the winner but it came after what looked like a bit of miscommunication I think Busquets' diagonal ball was meant for Torres who was making a run in behind and Alonso gets it instead good reading by Alonso Torres finds Lewandowski but that's off the board as well because Torres is way offside in the build-up and then even in the 95th minute of regular time Torres way offside on a shot that he passed instead of shooting and you have to say thank goodness for Ansu coming on late and scoring that goal in extra time to at least get Barcelona up 2-1 at that point. And it was the exact kind of goal that you'd love to see from Ansu Fati. Barca get the free kick, and it's a wonderful finish. Carvajal unable to clear, and Ansu, while moving away from goal, wraps his leg around it and got all of it. The kind of finish that reminds you just how few players can do that. But then, of course, Barcelona having issues. 101st minute, Alonso, very much like Alba and Torres, I said on the previous goal, completely loses Henrique. And that means that now there's a little bit of a mismatch. And then Raul Betis, very much like basketball, where they say, once you let the big man too deep, it doesn't really matter how good your post defense is. Once the big man gets his position in too deep, you're, you're, you're kind of beat there. At some point, you do clap your hands up and tip your hat to Laura Morone and that back heel finish for the 2-2. But as I said, it shouldn't have got to that point because Alonso should have been able to keep Henrique in front of him, which he didn't. And that goes back to the question of those subs being all wrong. Xavi, why not Balde? Was there a situation why you didn't put Balde in and you put Alonso in? These are one of those things where I know Barcelona and I defended the idea of Alonso as a squad player because that's who Barcelona is stuck with. But in this instance, you're not stuck with Alonso in that situation because you start at Alba. And, and to me, I think that's what Alonso is in theory. He's the backup left center back. And I like, as people know, Eric Garcia way better. So I don't understand how Alonso even moved ahead of Eric Garcia on the depth chart, uh, with the exception of maybe it's behind the scenes. Eric doesn't make that much, so I don't understand even trying to sell him at this point. Like He's a really cheap player. It would make more sense not to renew Alonso because Eric Garcia's wages are even cheaper. But I just It doesn't make sense to me from a squad building perspective, and I, and I don't understand why Xavi's using Alonso to the way that he is. I understand him, as I've said, being number 23, 24, 25, whatever. Like, that, that's fine. It's, it's a deep enough position. But to have him being put in this game instead of Balbe is completely baffling to me. And then headline five is Ter Stegen is the reason. And this does tell you that this is all about Amarcana Ter Stegen in that penalty shootout. I mean, good on Barcelona, of course. When you make all of your PKs, that means you're going to have a good shot of winning. I really thought the Betis was going to win this game. Honestly, when it went to PKs, knowing Claudio Bravo's reputation in those situations, we've seen Lewandowski been read a bit too good by those top quality PK goalkeepers. So Lewandowski, when he made his, well, that calmed me down just a little bit. And then Ter Stegen stepping up. Wanmi and Cavajal, not the best PKs themselves, but Ter Stegen also read him right, had a foot on the line so they didn't have to redo him and got the blocks when he needed to. Ter Stegen in this game, too, was also pretty much vintage Ter Stegen as we like. And that's one of the other positives I take out of this. 
Araujo and Koundé, it looks good. Yeah, there were some nervy moments, but those two look really solid as Barcelona's best starting back line. The De Jong, Pedri, Gabi thing, which should be the midfield trio for the rest of this season starting, that looked all good. And then Lewandowski, Rafinha, and Ansu getting his goal. So there were a lot of positives from this game, and Ter Stegen certainly should be one of those. Because he did have a lot of good saves in this game. 30th minute, the save off the Betis corner, and then another one a few minutes later. And then right before halftime, maybe his best of the day with that double save, culminating in that one-handed stop diving to his right. And we do have to change our thinking a little bit as to what is Xavi going to do. I think people are asking, is he completely outmatched for this job? Well, regardless of who the manager might be, if Xavi, who's still leading La Liga, I want to mention... If for some reason during the summertime Laporta decides to move on and we can all admit that maybe it didn't work for Xavi, I think another manager might look at what is there and that being Ter Stegen is in form or who knows the future, but Ter Stegen and what he's able to do at his top level, Araujo and Kunde and Balde, there are certainly pieces at the back and this is a team that's only conceded six goals in all of the Liga this season. So super weird what happens to them in knockout competitions and club competitions and that is all going back on the manager. So as I said, some positives, some negatives, some questions for Xavi, and obviously against Real Madrid, all of these questions we have are going to be amplified 100%. So am I happy that Barcelona are playing again? I don't know. It's an El Clasico that's not going to feel like El Clasico. It's for a trophy, and at this point I'm going to be happy with any trophy, but it's also the Spanish Super Cup, which is the one with the least prestige and the one that you just feel like, all right, well, at least we got one. So there it is. Those are your five headlines. Look out for the podcast tomorrow, because of course we'll talk to you soon. Until next time. Forza Barca.